So I was aware of Ignition for many years, but with Ignition not really having a presence in South Africa, you're just basically familiar with it by name. Mm. Knew what it can do, but never really worked with it too much. Then came the time when we had to evaluate. And I must say, it was, it was interesting. We had discussions with lots of vendors, and every vendor believes that their product is absolutely the best. Mm. Of um, course. We decided on ignition, so yeah. we not in the dark. <laughs> so so in, in, in that initial process, we obviously started by looking at the big players in the South African market. Mm. Ignition at that point was not a very big player in the South African market, and you do expose yourself to some risk. Local familiarity and local support is obviously local training. All, all of those support elements are naturally yeah. important. Yeah. So actually, ignition started on the back foot mm. in our evaluation yes. process. But um, and, and I like telling the story when. I actually originally, because Dion got to a point where he started nagging me about trialing ignition, and I literally gave him a week to just get it out of his system <laughs> and never speak of it yeah. <laughs> until I saw what it could do. <laughs> and that was that was quite a good. And thing. this was perspective. Or um, we only evaluated perspective. You started with perspective. This was all, uh, we didn't even entertain vision at the time mm. because it was one of our ways of getting buy-in from our mm -hmm. IT department, mm -hmm. that there will not be any local installations to maintain. As well as the mobility view and extensibility. It, it was the closest aligned to our, our strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, something that really caught me was, if you recall the earlier slide with our technology, technology roadmap. Yes. Initially, when we sat down and did that, which was earlier in 2019, I expected at least a five-year roadmap for that. Mm -hmm. The yellow boxes on that roadmap, we saw that we could probably take out of the box. Wow. Um, and that was one big selling point for us. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily everything is developed yet on our side, but the capabilities there mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. within the platform. Of course. And Dion, maybe through this process of your, um, did you find that the available learning and support resources, I'm thinking of, of something like Inductive University, which is obviously quite an intuitive learning platform, something like the, um, the user manual, public, very well documented. Did you find any of those initial resources helpful in the beginning? So definitely. Um, I, the inductive university for me was a very, very good introduction to the system. And it's great to see somebody demonstrating quickly what can be done. But when it comes to documentation, I'm a lot bigger fan of your traditional documentation, because I can skip the parts that I understand and I can mm. get to the parts that I don't. And when it comes to automation vendors, the documentation available online in the user manual from inductive automation is the best of any automation vendor I've ever seen. Okay. Um, had that not been accessible, mm. we might not have entertained it. Yeah. Um, so I can, from freely available resources, determine that the, the product can't do what I needed to do. Yeah. I still reference it daily. That's what we're refining on. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really, really good. Cool. So do you want to talk us through, so you found something that you believe to be fit for purpose and future fit. Do you want to talk us through some of the results as they align to your initial um, selection criteria and some of the observations? Yeah, so and this was 2019, this sorry. In 2019. And then last year, do you want to chat a little bit about the timing? Because mm -hmm. I think you were set and then we had uh, the introduction of COVID-19 and obviously huge impact um, by uh, from the from the pandemic. But all right, so maybe as it relates to your selection criteria, what what were the results so far? So first thing we had to make sure that we could talk to our PLC. We connected it. Thirty seconds later, we were browsing tags, communication established. So first box tick. What we then had to do is define some proof of concept. So can we? create UDTs that we can rapidly instantiate very quickly. Yes. Can we create standard symbols? Done. Can they launch a standard pop-up reusable? Could you give us we, a quick quick definition of UDT? Uh, yeah, user-defined uh, data type mm. um, and, for example, a valve. Mm. We don't want to go and say this valve has an open feedback and a closed mm. feedback and this one can be put in manual. All of that functionality is wrapped up into one defined data type of which we can instantiate hundreds of thousands if we need to. Saving lots of time. Yes, developers <laughs> use many. Um, that's it. So we, we devised a series of boxes to tick and you know, fail fast. 
and we went straight into the most difficult challenges and everything everywhere we got stuck it wasn't ignition that couldn't do it it's just us that didn't know how to do it their sales engineering were massively helpful saying okay no, 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 this is how it's done in ignition um, maybe sometimes it's a learning curve thing other times it's just something that we weren't familiar with mm. and it works we also tested where you can access it from phone clients pcs touch screens it worked beautifully and was this um, at one specific plant no this was, was all development um, all still development at your, testing at your environment. Office. okay yes and deliberately on the spec then we also yes. even had our redundancy that set up for robustness now being in food and beverage we have food safety regulations and it's very important to have history so with a story with very solid caching and store forward so mm -hmm. whatever happens we don't want to have gaps in our data because that's as you know that's usually mm -hmm. where something hit the fan and now suddenly we can't do it the genealogy trash. track and trace is a legal requirement yeah we yes. should be able to to yes. show that or, show at the least, to know. or at least have the data at least so have we can the data. reconstruct that <laughs> you can reconstruct it yeah. yes. so also we wanted to check the scalability and this comes out of the instantiation mm. and even in our, in our development environment we try to throw everything instantiate hundreds of thousands of tags mm. and these cpus just didn't go up <laughs> we actually thought we were doing something wrong the first time we <laughs> the first time we imported a whole import sheet no this didn't work oh no it's done <laughs> it's finished we we're expecting a long import <laughs> and it just worked um obviously the unlimited tags unlimited clients we knew that from the sales pitch put it to the test mm. and it was working it just kept meeting the requirements mm. And on the scalability side, you I see you've noted here multiple servers spread across multiple sites. So so is there something that you were able to test for? And naturally, I think to some extent yeah. you were able to with some simulated data and some simulated tags and inputs. But it's actually we the, the best test was probably when we rolled this out initially to just one unit in one factory. Hmm. And we put a physical box down at that site. It's, it's actually a great architecture because we have a physical box at that site with a virtual um, redundant partner at our head office, um, and it just works seamlessly. Okay. And we also we got the architecture as the beginning of a scale out architecture, mm. but we just haven't had the need to scale it out. Mm. That, maybe true. maybe we overspect our resources, but <laughs> or ignition is ridiculously light on resources, but it's going and at our biggest site we're up to three hundred thousand tags now. And, and about 61 mm. perspective sessions. 61 perspective, perspective sessions. sessions. Okay. Um, and mm. it's happily going along. So the scaling out, whether it's front in front load or, or back load or whichever, so if you haven't done that scaling out yet. Yeah, we'll do it when we need to. Um, and we have a, a clear plan for how to do it. Mm. It just doesn't seem necessary for the time being. Um, it's also in part of your, <clears throat> so, so when I think about the scalability and the capability, so also you included in, in your platform, you included various other systems and, and platforms. I think about Canary Story and the Flow Information Platform. I'm sure there's a host of others. Um, how did you find the, I, I imagine you did this as part of the development and the testing. How did you find the integration and the interoperability with Ignition and these other systems? So, What's great is Ignition, obviously, how it deals with APIs. So initially, when we tested it, we wanted to just check, can it consume data and store data? We're mm. using normal REST APIs. Yes. Um, but Canary offers a, a module, which almost makes it feel like a native historian. So mm. no proprietary configuration. We configure our historian or historizing requirements in the Ignition UDT. Yep. And it gets pushed seamlessly to Canary, and the same thing when we want to consume that data. For yep. example, in our trend faceplate, mm. is we don't have to use an API or any specific coding. Mm. It's a straight history binding that gets our data back out of Canary. Mm. It works really well. Yeah. And I know we specifically wanted to speak about the Ignition Exchange, but that kind of uh, whatever you want to call it, you want to call it a, a, um, a tool and in, um, an API. Uh, App that that you that you configure between the different systems. All of there's a number of these available on Ignition Exchange. So the, the timing of the Ignition Exchange. When did you when did you discover the Ignition well. Exchange? There was I, a I discovered it at the ICC conference. <laughs> <laughs> I still have the T-shirt. <laughs> it's too big. But yeah. <laughs> well, um, it it really helped because we had a number of ambitious features 
it just happened to be available on ignition mm. we could get it there certain things i knew knew where we were going but didn't know how to implement it mm. and we could some of it reused directly some of it needed a little bit of customization mm. but it definitely helped mm. and thanks for whoever put it up there so, so maybe discovered it a little bit late but you know we do see every every probably weekly there's there's some really really neat and useful and valuable things that are added there consistently and constantly which helps um, some of the simplicity, some of the ideals you have, if we have to take it back to your selection criteria, what in, in your views of simplicity, um, how did you find that for real? <laughs> well, it, of course, the simplicity for the operator, um, for the user, was just as we designed it. So mm -hmm. that was basically, we did it well. <laughs> and you, and you mentioned, <laughs> what is there, there uh, there you, mentioned you mentioned, sorry, you mentioned high performance HMI. Um, was um, we? I know some of the stuff that we, we can't share because it's proprietary and it's and it's um, uh, into your business. But high performance HMI and uh, situationally awareness, uh, aware designs and dashboards. There was a consideration and at least something that you you wanted to do from day one. Yes, yes. Um, it's something we started playing with in those early stages before we even this the selection, but mm -hmm. but. It, yeah, maybe it was good yeah. doing that beforehand because we had a lot of pushback from people who enjoyed having their HMIs look like Christmas trees. Yes. So we went through that little paradigm shift prior to going to ignition. So it wasn't a complete shock to the system. And, and we still get that with every new project. Why is it so great? <laughs> Why yeah. is it so boring? <laughs> Until you use it for a while. <laughs> Yeah, when you talk about the Christmas tree, you do still see a lot of those applications and designs um, that, that literally, and there is also a lot of familiarity with those. You know, as soon as you even just change two colors, um, well, hopefully if it's not red and green, but uh, the slightest change in that kind of design and color, there, there is familiarity that goes with that. So there's a big adoption around that kind of design. So we design the whole system with that motto of don't scream that everything is normal. Yes. So if you walk past one of our HMIs and nothing attracts your attention, that's a good thing. Mm. If you see something, you can spot it from across the room, and it's not right. It requires attention. Mm. So the the navigation for the user we spoke about, the reusable assets with rapid instantiation for to help uh, and not really help, but more enable the integrator to do the rollout uh, a lot faster. Uh, the runtime editing and configuration for the commissioning engineer. Can you? Uh, oh, this is a that? breath of fresh air. Um, so we we pushed a lot of the configuration into the runtime. So. You can change descriptions. None of that, oh, there's a spelling error there. Let's fix that later. And then you never do. You can fix it there and then. So you can Step do that on the fly because I think yes. a lot of people uh, Absolutely. don't you know can, that. They're not familiar. You, you don't have to go to an engineering station. You can mm -hmm. do it from the touch screen mounted in plot. If you see a step description that's a little bit off, you do it right there. Mm -hmm. um, what else is there? Oh, the dashboard. It's amazing. Uh, so we have lots of widgets configured. Mm -hmm. And you don't always know what an operator needs to see while you're designing and developing. Mm. It's usually when you're commissioning. So, oh, you've got to keep an eye on that temperature. So then we know that temperature we put on the screen. And it's not something that we have to go and do in the office. Mm. We just instantiate it right there, save it, and it's done. Right, so the testing and implementation, you you did the proof of concept, which was in your development environment. You then, decide, you then did a production trial. And this was which site was this? It was in Port Elizabeth. That was Port Elizabeth. Yes. Port Elizabeth. Can you maybe give us an idea of, of the sort of time frames involved from, from proof of concept to actually going live? So this was early in 2020 that we yes. did that trial. It, it, was a, it was an ideal unit to test on because mm -hmm. it was one that we did fairly, fairly recently before that. Mm -hmm. As Dion mentioned, we wanted something that fits on our existing PLC mm -hmm. infrastructure and standards. So that was the freshest version that we had of, had of our PLC standards. Mm. So it was the best test. Um, and we commissioned that in a kind of parallel situation to, to kind of, you know, you, you want to stress test it, but you want yes. us to continue with production. Continue production yeah. And we very quickly noticed that the fallback parallel HMI was not being used. But to add to your timing of everything, mm. that was just when COVID restrictions he did. And Correct. we actually did that trial without visiting the factory. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> true. Because with this, within this environment, the ability to work together in close proximity is, is such a such a key thing. So all of a sudden you have COVID-19, pandemic, 
you, you, you're not really worried about mobility, you just want to be able to work remotely yes. and then do it together as a team or go to site. Um, so that, that was almost forced, but you had the ability to do that and maybe now it's become part of your, your design philosophy and, and the actual way that you work. Correct. There, there were a lot of learnings that we took from there. Um, I think, I think there's, there's a couple of changes we did in our, our methodology that is just going to stick forever. 